are um, just working our way through First John chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, this is our sixth week in, and uh, we will get through it here before summer starts. But um, I want to let you know that uh, I will be gone this next week to Mexico. Um, that is one of my uh, favorite things that we do is go down there and take a team of people. Uh, we've got a good mixture of people who've been before and new people going on that trip. And um, talked with Paul Lovino today, uh, getting ready for this trip. Um, but uh, you're probably wondering what's going to happen next Wednesday night. Uh, so here's what's going to happen next Wednesday night. We're going to have midweek service. Now, we're not going to have kids or youth next Wednesday night because it's spring break. And we kind of uh, follow the school calendar in that uh, uh, during these holidays kind of things. So there will be no kids and youth next week. But we will have our, our regular midweek service here for adults. And uh, Pastor Carter, Pastor Craig and Jeanette Carter are going to be with us next Wednesday night. We'll have worship. They'll preach and minister in music. And it's going to be a great time. So come on out and join. Even though uh, I won't be here, uh, it'll be even better because I won't be here. Okay? So just, you know, don't, don't be like, oh, this is not, they're not having it. or they're, We're doing it. Okay? So be here. Um, Tonight is we're in chapter 2, verse 18 through 28. It's kind of a, a long passage of scripture. We've been dealing in the last few weeks. We've just worked through three scriptures. So uh, you're going to say, how, uh, how will we get through 11 scriptures tonight if it's taken the full time to get through three? Well, I'll tell you this. The, here's, the, here's what you need to know about preaching. Is that when you have a short text, three sh- scriptures, it's a really long sermon. And when you have a really long text, it's a really short sermon, okay? Just that's what you need to know. Um, but uh, tonight, the topic is we've talked about a Christ follower's guide to relationships. What, what's our relationship? What's our relationship with Jesus? What's our relationship with sin? What's our, our, our relationship with the commandments? What's our, our relationship uh, with, uh, uh, with the world, as we talked last week? Um, tonight, we're going to talk about something that's interesting here in 1 John, and that is... Um, What's a Christ follower's relationship with Antichrist, with Antichrist? Maybe you, you didn't expect that to come up in 1 John, uh, but uh, John, who wrote the Revelation, uh, introduces us to the Antichrist here in 1 John in this passage of Scripture. So we're going to notice a few observations, and then we'll make some application here at the end. Um, but let's look here at the, uh, the idea of antichrist as we think what's our relationship as followers of christ what's our relationship with antichrist or antichrists as you'll notice in this passage but let's look at chapter 2 verse 18 children this is john the elder uh late in life uh been an original apostle follower of jesus pastor uh and now he's he's later in life and so this is one of his terms of endearment to the people of his church he says children Children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists, plural, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. And uh, let's, let's dissect that verse a little bit and say, what is he talking about here? Um, you'll, you'll notice he says it's the last hour. He uses that at the beginning and at the end, that we know it's the last hour. What, what's the last hour? The last hour is synonymous, really, with terms like last days, last times, end of the ages, the end times. We're kind of maybe familiar with some of those other phrases uh, that, are, that are used. But really, it's this final period before Christ's return that was inaugurated, was launched by Christ's first coming. When, when Jesus came, he launched a new era I, I want to say new age, but that has some weird connotation to it, depending, right? Uh, but, you know, this new era, new period of time was launched by Jesus, and that is the last days, the end times, or as John says particularly here, he says the last hour. So I would say this, is if the writers of the New Testament believe they were living in the end times or the last days, and by the time we get to 1 John, which is late in the first century, he says we're in the last hours. I would wonder if we are in the last minutes or the last seconds of history, if that was the way John viewed it himself. 
uh, Jesus inaugurated the last days, the last hour in his first coming. And John makes reference to this. We've already talked about this earlier, but let's look at chapter 2, verse 8, 1 John 2, 8. At the same time, it's a new commandment, the commandment to love one another, that I am writing to you, which is true in Jesus and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Jesus came and he ended the darkness. The, the darkness began to pass away by Jesus coming and the true light began to shine into this world. In chapter 2, verse 17, we, we read this last week. It's the verse right in front of the passage we're looking tonight. He says, the world is passing away, just like he said in verse 8. The world is passing away along with his desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so Jesus has come and these ushered in this new time period, the last days, the end times, the final hour, the last hour here, uh, that will be consummated with his return. And, and so we see these phrases used throughout uh, the New Testament. And then the other phrase that we want to look at is the idea of antichrist, or the plural, antichrist. Now, you probably have heard that phrase, antichrist, uh, somewhere along the road uh, of life, whether you've been a believer or not, you probably have heard the phrase antichrist. And uh, John is the one who coins that phrase. It's actually only found in John's letters. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. John's the originator of that phrase. Um, now, Paul will talk about the same person, the antichrist, a singular person who's kind of the face of evil in the end times, uh, who leads a rebellion against God, uh, he'll call him the man of lawlessness. But John, who wrote this, who writes Revelation, will typically call him the beast, a wild animal that is ferocious. But his earlier writings here is the Antichrist. And uh, we, would, we would just break that word down, Antichrist, and we would think about what those words mean, that, that, that compound word means. Uh, we would know Christ, that's Christ, we know who Christ is. And then anti in front of it, our natural instinct is to say anti means against. If you're anti, you are against something. If you are anti-slavery, you are against slavery, as you should be, right? Okay, uh, but, uh, but often today in our world, we think anti is against. But the Greek, the original language of this carries another nuance, and it carries the idea of not just being against, but instead of. Instead of. And so we know the Antichrist will be against Christ, the real Christ, but he'll come against him in a way where he passes himself off as a false Christ, as an instead of Christ. He will be a counterfeit, and, um, and, and he will lead the world in rebellion against God in the last days. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, John talks about there is an Antichrist, a singular figure, but here he uses a phrase, he puts a plural to it, and he says there's antichrists that have already come. And, uh, and over in chapter 4, verse 3, he talks about the spirit of antichrist that is in the world today. And, um, and so he's saying, we know in the last hour that the antichrist will come. And in fact, many antichrists have already come, is what he's saying at this time. And, um, and he says, that's how we know this is the last hour. Is because we know we're living in this last time because the Antichrists have come. And really what John is referencing is the words of Jesus. Let's go over in the, in the gospel. Let's go to the Matthew's gospel. The first gospel of the New Testament here. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is a, a, a discourse by Jesus on the end times. And uh, we're going to read a few verses here about that to see where John's getting this idea from. And uh, he says in Matthew 24, verse 1, Matthew's uh, one of the, the, the early followers of Jesus, records this conversation with Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're very beautiful. They, they want to say, hey, make sure we do the sightseeing tour here. We're in the temple area. Notice all the beautiful buildings that are here. And uh, verse 2, he said, But Jesus answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And verse 3, And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, this is 
across, directly across the, the uh, Kidron Valley there, uh, looking at the temple. Uh, he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be. That's question number one. When will these things, be, when will the temple be overthrown? And uh, part of Matthew 24 answers that. We, we know in AD 70, the temple is overthrown in a rebellion against the Roman Empire. Um, one stone ter- literally is not left upon one another because they, uh, an anxious soldier set the temple on fire. The temple was gold-plated, and so when it got on fire, all the gold melted and ran down in all the cracks, and so they literally had to overturn every stone to get the gold out, right? Uh, and, and so that literally happened. So the first question is, is, tell us when these things will be. And second question, what will be the signs of your coming? And third question is, and what are the signs of the end of the age? Okay, so three questions there. And Matthew 24 kind of goes back and forth, and you kind of got to get the context of which, answer, which question he's answering where in, in this. But, uh, but he said, what, what are the signs of the end of the age? What is, what's the last hour? How are we going to know we're living in the last hour? And verse 4 says this, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, right? There's going to be false Christ. There's going to be anti-Christ, people who come and claim to be Christ. They are instead of Christ and ultimately against Christ. And then we just skip down to verse 11 of chapter 24. It says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And so John is thinking about what Jesus said there in Matthew 24 on the Temple Mount, and, um, and he's thinking, you know, Jesus said in the last days that there's going to be false Christ. There's going to be false uh, people who deceive and lead people away. And we're seeing that right now in John's time. There was a great uh, heresy, uh, the Gnostic heresy that we've talked about in previous weeks, that, that is leading people from his church astray and deceiving them. And he's saying, you know, because we're seeing these antichrists, we realize we're in the last days. And Today, we would look at that and say, hey, look at all the false religion. Look at all the antichrists who are either obviously blatantly against Christ or posing themselves to be a Christ, a Messiah, a Savior for the world. And we realize that we're in the last hours also along with John and his readers. Then look at verse 19, if you will. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2 and let's look at verse 19. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, um, John is continuing this thought. And he says, um, he says they, they went out from us, they, the Antichrist, went out from us, but they were not of us. For them, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. That would kind of make sense. Like He says, hey, they weren't really from us or of us. They weren't us because they left. And they left to show that they weren't part of us. And uh, if you've been paying attention to to 1 John, John's been using very personal pronouns, you and us. But for the first time, he's introduced this this pronoun, they. Us and they. Uh, They're obviously in opposition to one another. And he's saying they're not, they are not of us. Because they went out from us and it made it obvious that they were not part of us because they left us. And uh, he's saying they're not, they're, they're not of us. They're not, they're not who we are as people, uh, as, as followers of Jesus. They, they didn't belong with us. Um, and that raises two questions for us. This raises two questions for us. They, these antichrists, I mean, you know, John's pretty blunt in his language, isn't he? He's like, these people left the church. You know what they are? They're antichrists. I don't know. I would never call anybody that. But, you know, you know they left us. They're antichrists. Um, there's a reason why. I'll tell you in a minute why he's saying that. But, um, but he, he, he's, he's very blunt about it. But what the question that comes up is, um, when he says they're not of us, does he mean that they were a part of the church that John was overseeing the Johannian community, was he, were they part of that church, attending the church, but not really believers? And so they left because, well, they were never believers to begin with. 
Or does he mean that they were believers, they had accepted Jesus, they believed in Jesus, but they got caught up in deception and lies and falsehood, and they departed from their faith? And really, depending on kind of your, your stream of faith that you grew up in or what your, your, your view is of this, if, if you're a, a Calvinistic, if you believe in Calvinism, uh, that's kind of the once saved, always saved. Your answer would be, no, these people were never saved to begin with because they couldn't leave if they were. And if you're into Arminianism, which we as assemblies of God, we, we lean towards Arminianism, more free will and free choice of things, we would say they were saved, but they, they left the faith. They departed. There was an apostasy, a departure from the faith. And, and you can work that out one way or another, how, how you want to view that. Uh, I'm going to lean toward the second one, that they were believers and that they, they, they left, they forfeited their salvation. They fell from grace, whatever terminology, because that's apparently possible because New Testament speaks several times about people who've departed from the faith, people who fell away, pe- people who left the grace of God. Um, and, and so um, the first thing we notice in this passage is John's talking about these antichrists who were part of them in some capacity, and they left them, and, and now they are you know, saying they are Christ instead of, or they are against Christ in some capacity. And then John changes gears really quick in verse 20 down to verse 27, quite a, a large passage here, and he talks about the anointing, the anointing. Uh, in First John 2, 20, he says, but, now they, this is what they did, but you, contrast, but you, have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Um, There's a lot of words in that one, and we got to say, what what do all those mean? So let's talk about the Holy One, the Holy One. In the Old Testament, the Holy One is a reference to God. In the New Testament, it appears more as a reference to the Son of God, Jesus, the Son, right? In John chapter 6, we could go through a lot of verses, but John chapter 6 Verse 68, because let's go to John's gospel to see how John wrote. And in John 6, 68, Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Demons make that same profession. You're the Holy One. It's, It's throughout the New Testament. The title is is to Jesus in the New Testament. So he says, uh, you've received this from the Holy One. So this is something Jesus gave to believers. And he says, you were anointed, you were anointed. Now, the word anointed, or anointing, really just applies to, to the act of applying oil or, or, or an oily liquid, typically to the head of the body. Uh, you know, uh, you anoint my head with fresh oil, would be Psalm 23. In the Old Testament, when a king was, a, was made king, they anointed the king with oil. When there was a priest selected, they appointed oil upon their head. Uh, and, and so there, there's this idea that oil is a designation. This anointing is a designation of God's choice. And um, we, we today don't we still anoint people who are sick and, and different things with oil. Uh, but really, in the New Testament, as we look at the anointing, it's not so much in a, a, a physical act of pouring oil or rubbing oil or smearing oil on someone, but it's really a spiritual uh, impartation. So let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is when Jesus begins his public ministry. He has just been baptized in water, been filled with the Holy Spirit, gone 40 days in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil we talked about last week. And he comes back in the power of the Holy Spirit and he goes to synagogue and uh, they they hand him the scroll to read. And it just so happens that this is the passage for that day's reading. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he's quoting, he's reading from Isaiah and he says, "The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So we see that the New Testament, when we think about anointing, it's not so much about physical, tangible oil, although sometimes that's used as a representation of the Holy Spirit. 
but the anointing in the New Testament is really about the Holy Spirit's impartation on a person's life to empower them, to designate them, to set them apart for God's purpose. And, uh, and so he says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. And you all have knowledge. You all have knowledge. And, and so we realize the Holy Spirit, one of the things that Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, what's he going to do? He's going to give knowledge to people. So let's just look at a few uh, passages here from John's gospel. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 17. Jesus speaking in all of these, in these passages. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you. And he will be in you. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 15, 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he'll bear witness to me. He'll bear witness about me. John 16, verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So here John is saying, we've got antichrists who are going out to deceive people. And there's a little play on words here. Because antichrist, the holy one, is the anointed one, Christos. And then we have been anointed, charisma, they're all same root, word root family. And so you say, these guys, they, they thought they were, but they're not. But from the real anointed one, we have been anointed. He has given us his spirit, and his spirit gives us knowledge, leads us into all truth, reveals things to us, is a witness of Jesus, guides us into truth. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, let's go back to 1 John Chapter 4, verse 13, John writes to his followers and he says, By this we know that we abide in Jesus, and Jesus is in us because he has given us of his spirit. The spirit of God comes and lives inside you when you're born again. And he says that's how we know we're of him is because the spirit, Romans eight sixteen, Paul would say it this way, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are the sons and daughters of God. And so he says, hey, you guys know this. You have this knowledge already because the spirit of God lives inside of you. And obviously Jesus taught that when we are born again of the spirit of God, uh, that's the first work, conversion. And then Jesus said, not many days from now, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there's a separate, secondary, subsequent work of the Holy Spirit in which you receive power to be a witness for Jesus. Okay, so John's kind of tracking along those lines there uh, of this uh, passage. So let's go to verse 21. 1 John 2, 21. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth. So I'm not writing to you because you don't know this. You have knowledge from the Holy Spirit. I'm writing not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. He says, it's not that you're in ignorance. You know this. The Holy Spirit bears witness to this truth in your life. He says, I'm writing to you because you also know that there is no lie of the truth. The Antichrist who went out and departed, they were perverted the truth. They had some lie to it. They were you know, slanted in some way towards a lie. And, uh, and John says, hey, there's no lie of the truth. If there's a lie in the truth, then it's not truth. Does that make sense to everybody? Like, oh, it's a little white lie. Yeah, it wasn't a little white truth. It was a little white lie, right? Okay. He said, hey, there's a lie in it. It's not true. And they're just, oh, no, no. We just we got a new revelation. We got a new take on this. Look at it from this angle. And, and John just like, no, no, that's not true. Okay. So um, uh, uh, John's been saying this all along. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Jesus while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. 1 John 1, 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 2, 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandment, 
is a liar, and the truth is not in him. All of those passages, now we begin to understand, this group of antichrists who went out from the church, those were all things that they were saying and they were doing. And that's why John's answering those things in that way. Because he's saying, hey, there's no, there's no lie in the truth. These guys, they're lying. They, 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 they said there was no sin that they needed to repent of. Hey, they were walking in darkness. They weren't living like Jesus. Hey, they, they didn't walk in the light like Jesus was in the light. Uh, they didn't keep his commandments. They were, they were breaking his commandments, but saying they know him. And that's not possible to do those two things. And, um, and so in verse 22, he answers, who's this liar? Who's this liar? Verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. Um, so we understand this group of antichrists were denying Jesus is the Christ. Now, either they were saying that the human Jesus was a good, godly, maybe had God consciousness, enlightenment, but he wasn't really divine. He wasn't really the Christ. Or they were saying, no, there's a Christ, but he's not Jesus because he was just spiritual and he wasn't earthly and physical and, you know, that, that he may have looked like he had a human appearance, but he wasn't really man. And uh, either, one way or another, they were lying because they weren't embracing who Jesus is in his fullness. He's fully God and he's fully man. And if we don't have this combination of fully God and hum, fully man, we don't have salvation. Because if Jesus is only a man and died on a cross for us, he was as guilty as all of us were, and there's no salvation. If he's just God, he's separate from us, he can't be a substitute for us, and we have no salvation. The only way we have salvation is if God becomes human and dies in our place on a cross to free us. And so he says, who's the liar? The liar is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And there was a lot of... Um, a false teaching and heresy during this time uh, that, that spread. And so th this was a very real issue for them. And, uh, and then in verse, the rest of that verse, and the rest of that verse, he says, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. And so, again, there was some denial over who Jesus was. He wasn't the Son. Um, he wasn't divine. He may have been just a good teacher, a good person. Maybe he had some enlightenment. Maybe he got God conscious. We don't know what they were saying, but somehow they denied who he was. Well, let's look at verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Anybody who denies the Son doesn't have a relationship with the Father. And whoever confesses the Son has the Father also, okay? So if you deny the Son, you don't have a relationship with God the Father either. I believe in God, but I just don't believe in Jesus. Well, John says, if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. And whoever confesses the Son has the Father. That's a bonus, right? Yeah, I got the Father also. Here's what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you deny the Son, you can't get to the Father. Whoever denies the Father, the Son doesn't have the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So let's, look, let's look at verse 24 here. John's encouraging his followers. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in, the, in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. He's saying, hey, what you've heard from the beginning, that, that phrase in the beginning is very important to John. He starts his gospel off. He starts this letter off with beginning. He, he, he talks about fathers and children, knowing him who's from the beginning. And, and so you can say, hey, hey don't, don't fall prey to a new truth, a new revelation. Hey, just stick with what you've known from the beginning. It's trustworthy. It's reliable. It stood the test of time. That doesn't mean it can't be communicated in new, fresh ways. But whenever somebody has... I got a new revelation, and it's not, Jesus isn't who he said he was. Hey, don't, don't believe that, right? Okay. That, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't from God. That was the Mexican food you ate too late at night. Okay. Um, so he says, hey, if what you heard from the beginning, if you're grounded in that truth, what you heard, the gospel, the foundation of the gospel, then he says, you're going to abide in the Father and in the Son. The word abide just means to continue. It means to remain, to stay there. Verse 25. And this is the promise that he's made to us, eternal life. If we abide in him, we're going to have eternal life. This is the promise he made. Now, he's not quoting any one particular verse here. He's kind of, you know, 
just paraphrasing a bunch of promises that Jesus has made. But John comes to the same idea. that This is the promise he's made to us, eternal life. He comes to that same thought here in chapter 5. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. How do we know we have eternal life? Well, that life is in his son. Verse 12, whoever has the son has life, has eternal life. Whoever does not have the son does not have eternal life. You plus Jesus equals eternal life. You minus Jesus equals no eternal life, right? And so he's saying, this is the promise we have in him. If we'll abide in him, we have eternal life. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Let's look at verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. He said, that's why I'm writing. I'm writing this to you. Again, multiple reasons why John wrote that their joy would be full, that they encouraged in chapter 2, uh, verse 12 through 14. But here's another reason. Hey, I'm writing so th- about these guys who deceive you. Verse 27 brings us back to verse 20 kind of it's an incluso it it wraps us back to verse 20 it's bookends this passage and he says i write the he says in verse 27 but the anointing that you receive from him from jesus abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you so i don't know what you guys are doing here tonight because you don't need anybody to teach you now that's not what he said i don't need a bible teacher i don't need a pastor i can just He's not saying that you don't, we don't have a need. One of the fivefold gifts in Ephesians 4 is, is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We, we need that gift. But he's saying when it comes to the truth, the Holy Spirit inside of you bears witness with the truth. You know the truth because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And he, he's the spirit of truth, and he guides us into all truth. When you hear something that's not true, the Holy Spirit inside of you says, oh, no, no, that's not, you know, be careful, that's not, something's not right about that. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Uh, He says, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as he has taught you, abide in, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Just keep staying in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will keep doing his work inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will keep teaching you and guiding you and directing you, um, and and it will be that, that witness you know, for old, old-time old Pentecostals, we'd say, I got a check in my spirit. Anybody ever heard that phrase? You know, I got a check in my spirit. I, I don't know what it is, but they're just something. I got a check in my spirit. That's the Holy Spirit say, oh, a little lie detector of the Holy Spirit going, wait, 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 alarms are going off. There's something wrong. Red flags, right? Okay. Um, and the last thing, we're going to wrap up real quick here, is he's talked about the Antichrist. He's talked about the anointing. The way we overcome the Antichrist is through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that he wants us to say, to say tonight is about abide, to abide in him. Look at verse 28. And now, little children, this ties it back to children in verse 18. And now, little children, abide in him. Remain, continue in Jesus. Why? So that when he appears, because it's the last hour, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. I want to be ready for his coming. I don't want to be ashamed of his coming. I don't have to shrink back at his coming. I don't want the thought of his coming to fear fear my life. I want to have boldness and confidence that he's coming. And if I just abide in him, the word abide is used seven times throughout this passage that we look tonight. Continue, abide, 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 abide. So what's the application for us before we go? The application is, There's not much we can do about the Antichrist. We couldn't stop him. John couldn't stop them from going out. But here's our part, is we abide. We abide, number one, in Jesus. We abide in Jesus, like over and over in this passage. Abide in him, abide in him, abide in him. Number two, we abide in the anointing in the Holy Spirit. We let the Holy Spirit reside and have way in our life. We, we seek more of his presence, more of his power to be his witnesses, and his Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. The third thing we abide in is we abide in the truth. We abide in the truth. If that which you've heard from the beginning abides in you, so we just, hey, you know what? Sometimes hearing the truth over and over again, you're like, I've heard this. I'm tired of this. Give me something new. Well, you know, that's what Paul says in the last days. People won't endure sound teaching because they'll have itchy ears ready to be tickled to hear something new that pleases them. 
And so we just got to abide in the truth and say, yep, this is true, this is true, this is true. And then the fourth thing that we abide in is in community, is in Christian community. John says in verse 19, they went out from us because they never were really a part of us. And it was obvious that they weren't a part of us because they left. And in the world today, we meet people who say, I love Jesus, but I'm not a part of a church. And John says those things can't exist. If you're going to make it today, you know, the one passage that we quote, so, 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 so I'm closing my Bible so you know we're done. Okay. Um, the one passage we quote the most about church attendance is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people have given up attending church and, you know, COVID was a big disruptor and, and shook up things. And people today, you know, a, 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 a regular church attender comes one out of four Sundays a month. I know all of you here, you're a five out of four Sundays a month. You're here, right? But, but he says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's the day of Jesus. We, we need to be in community. We need to be with one another. We need to be hearing the truth. We need to be walking in the anointing and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and abiding in Jesus. Let's stand tonight as we pray. Father, we thank you tonight that even though we live in the last hour, or maybe the last moments or seconds of history before your return, we do not want to be ashamed at your coming. Lord, we want to have boldness and confidence at your return. Lord, we want to be remain faithful in you, in the truth, in the anointing, and in community. Help us to walk that truth out because there are many deceivers, many counterfeits, many, many false uh, revelations and false prophets and teachers in the world today that, that just they, they, they vary by a degree or two. It's not, it's not a blatant outright lie, but it's just off by a little bit. But you said there is no lie of the truth. And so we've got to be grounded in the truth, grounded in Jesus, grounded in the anointing, grounded and rooted in community. Lord, help us as a, as a, as a church body to walk that out and live that out in the day and age that we live in and encouraging one another so much the more as we see the day of your return approaching. Lord, I pray tonight for your people. I pray that you would bless them. Lord, that you would protect them and keep them safe. Lord, I pray that you'd provide for them and meet every need that they have. I ask that they would know your eye is upon them and you're smiling over them. Give us your favor and your peace as we go our way tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.